God truly has an amazing love for us and has given us amazing grace. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the gift of grace. And thank you, Lord, for the gift of your spirit to lead us and guide us. And Lord, we ask that your spirit now instruct us and teach us. That your spirit will comfort us and guide us. That we will sit here in your presence, Lord, with open hearts and open minds, with no communication barriers, to be able to truly hear what you have for us. Father God, we worship you. We love you. We want to know you. So as we open your word, Lord, just show us what you have for us. Christ. You know, there are things that we do in life that we have a love-hate relationship with, right? I mean, you may love to play the piano, but you may hate to practice. You may love to sing, but, wow, warming up your voice, etc. You may love to run. There's some runners here to do cross-country, etc. But all that stretching and getting ready, etc. You have that sense of accomplishment when you're done. But during the process, oh, lesson planning, teachers. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a struggle, right? I have a love-hate relationship with writing. I've wanted to be a writer ever since I was in second grade. I knew that that was what I was to do. But I have a love-hate relationship with it. Because I guarantee you, I sit down and I open up my computer or whatever and I begin. And it is like I am sweating blood. It is tough. <coughs> Some people, they just, yeah, 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 yeah. not me. But when I'm done with it... I feel good about myself. I feel that I have accomplished what I set out to do. I have the same problem with sermons. Whenever I'm having to write a sermon, it is this love-hate relationship. I go, oh, I have to write the sermon now. I have to struggle. I have to sweat blood. I have to go through that process of writing that sermon. And one of the hardest things about writing the sermon, though, is waiting on God. You know, if it's just me writing a review or, or an article or whatever it may be, I can just muddle through it, right? I'll force myself, and it's, if it's good, it's good. If it's not so good, oh well, I'll call it good anyway. You know, I just you, know, you just kind of muddle through it. You can't do that with God. You can't do that with writing a sermon because you're handling something precious. You're handling God's word. And so I have to wait on God. I have to wait on what He's wanting to tell me. And that can be tough. That can be really, really hard because we don't like to wait. We hate to wait. But the thing is, we must. Because this work has to be spirit-led. You know, churches oftentimes start these great ministry programs. They have this wonderful idea. They sit in committees and they come up with, we're going to do this program. And it may be popular. They may be bringing in lots and lots of people. It may seem to be a success. But unless there is a spiritual fruit there, it's not. You see, you can always tell because a ministry that produces spiritual fruit, even if it's small, is going to be spirit-led. The other ministries are just man-led. 
The other things are just man led. That's why it's so important that whatever we do in ministry, whether it's writing a sermon or if it's teaching a Sunday school class or if it's working in a connect group or whatever, needs to be spirit led. Because you're handling something precious. You're dealing with the Word of God. You're dealing with what He wants to communicate to the world. We need to live a Spirit-led life. And Paul is looking back on a Spirit-led life in our memory verse today. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 7. It says, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Those three statements, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, those are inspiring to me. I would love to end my life and be able to say that in complete confidence. That I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Wouldn't you? As Christians, wouldn't you want to be in your life to be able to say that with complete confidence? Amen. Amen. We do. But what does it really mean, though? I say this is an example of him having led the Spirit-led life, and being able to say that. What does it really mean to live the Spirit-led life? You might say, well, that's self-explanatory, Pastor Joe. It means being led by the Spirit. Duh. You know? But there's a lot of aspects to it. There are a lot of aspects to having the Spirit-led life. For example, there's the waiting part. Once again, like I was talking about, the waiting part. You know, God may ask you as a Christian to wait on a relationship. He may say, you know what? I understand that you want to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. But you need to wait. Because I haven't brought that person to you. And yet we try to make it happen, don't we? We go, oh, well, I can't, maybe I didn't hear right, you know. I need to date this person or that person or this person or whatever. And God may be saying, no, no, no. you need to wait. I have someone in mind. And that's hard. Because we want to take charge. God, God may say, you know what? I want you to wait on just the right job opportunity. There's something happening. You, there is a a plan that I have in mind. You might say, no, I can't. I'm going to settle for something else. Maybe God's saying you need to wait. It might be a friend or a neighbor or someone like that you feel that you, you really want to talk to. And maybe God is saying tonight, this, this is just not the right time. You need to wait. And that's uncomfortable. But a spirit-led life when we wait on God, the results are always going to be best. Because He always knows what's best for us. And now the thing is dependence. You know, as a missionary, one of the things we had to do in faith-based missions is depend on finances. Depend on God to provide them. And that is tough. When you are waiting for a church or individuals to pony up the money, man, that's tough. It really stretches you. I have spent many nights at just practically pulling what little hair there is left out of my head because, of, you know, where's the money going to come from? But being a spirit-led Christian means waiting on God. Letting Him be in charge and depending on Him to provide. Depending on Him in all aspects. It also means another aspect is not only receiving comfort and encouragement, but giving comfort and encouragement. Of knowing just when and where that's appropriate. Because the Spirit is leading them to it. So like I said, there's a lot of different aspects to being a Spirit-led believer, a Spirit-led Christian. But one of the most telling features of a spirit-led life is total surrender. Total 
surrender to His will. And when you totally surrender to His will, when you allow yourself to just be completely open and say, here I am, God, send me. That leads to something we call compulsion. Now, compulsion, when I say that, immediately your brain is probably going, wait a minute, compulsion? You know, compulsion is negative, right? The dictionary definition says an irresistible urge to behave in a certain way, especially against one's conscious wishes. He felt a compulsion to babble on about what had happened. Synonyms are like urge and impulse and need and desire and drive. We think of OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. You walk around, you're walking down a, a fence row and you feel you have to touch each post. So we think compulsion, that's bad, right? But compulsion can be positive. You can see a woman being attacked and you are compelled to help. That's a positive compulsion. You see a person who is crying and you are compelled to give them a hug. You, you see a, a person who is obviously hungry and you are compelled to reach in and grab your last dollar and give to that person. That's are positive. And the Spirit-led life, when you are to totally surrender to God, be prepared for compulsion. Be prepared for God to compel you. See, the different, difference between a positive and negative compulsion and who or what is driving you. That's, that's where the, the difference lies. True spirit-led Christians follow His lead, not their own lead, it's not the world's lead, but His lead. And they are, hear this, compelled to listen and obey. They are compelled to listen and obey. I bought myself not long ago a pair of wireless headphones. I was tired of my cord and having problems and different things like that. And I've discovered I really like them. I really like having those Bluetooth headphones on. And I can go about and I can do the dishes or do whatever with these on. But I've discovered that depending on what music you are listening to, et cetera, there's a sweet spot. There is a certain level of volume, and I couldn't even tell you what it is, et cetera, that if there's a certain music come on, and some of you guys have probably experienced this too, that all of a sudden you cannot help but move to the beat, right? I mean, there's this some catchy song, and you're just like... You know, whatever, you know, you're bouncing around and people are looking like you're out of your mind because they can't hear the music. Right? But you're moving to the music. Oh, wow, you know, this is great. You can't help yourself because it has got a compulsion on you. You're being compelled. When we are completely open to the Spirit, when we have totally surrendered our hearts. We are choosing to be available to hear His voice. We are choosing to be compelled by His voice into action, to listen. However, there are two forms of compulsion here, right? Listening and obeying. We can get to the point where we are compelled to listen. We can't help but hear His Spirit talking to us. But, there's a step to where it moves into obedience. I asked my wife if I could share this with you before I did this, because my wife is, before I said this, because my wife is one of these people that I feel that really has got that in tune. You know, she hears the Spirit really well. And the other day, we took our car down to the shop and got it fixed changed the battery, etc. It hadn't been able to start. And when she drove it back home, that little voice of the Spirit said, you need to call Jamie back and take it back because there's something not right. It's driving. 
Everything seems okay, but there's something not right. And instead of moving from listening to obeying, my wife talked herself out of it. Ah, uh, well, we'll just we'll just drive it for a while. We'll see what happens. She went yesterday to start the car. <laughs> Not working again. So we will have to take it back on Monday. It's a little thing, right? It's a little thing. But she allowed, and I do it too. She allowed the voice to go unheeded. Not moving and obeying when we were told what to do. So why don't we? Why don't we obey? When we hear the Spirit telling us something, we hear the Spirit to go talk to somebody, we hear the Spirit to, to do something, why don't we do it? Well, because we allow fears. We allow doubts. We allow insecurities. We allow distractions to come in. I talked about that sweet spot on the music, right? If you lower the volume, the compulsion to move around is gone. If you raise it too high, then that's too distracting and it's gone. We do the same thing with the Spirit. We can get to the point where we allow the fears and doubts and distractions in and it keeps us from going to that next step, from not just listening to the Holy Spirit, but obeying the Holy Spirit. As we look at the life of Paul, we see a man, all the way we've been seeing him ever since conversion, we see a man more and more in tune with the Spirit. More and more he's listening. He's choosing to get that volume just right, to hear what the Spirit is saying to him, to move into total surrender. And total surrender when I say that, I understand that it is totally scary. Total surrender, you say, whoa. I want to be in control. I don't want the, the spirit even controlling me. But I guarantee you something. Total surrender is not what you think. When you are totally surrendered, and I've been there. I wish I was walking there all the time. But when you are totally surrendered. When you go to God and you say, I'm done. I am done with trying to handle things on my own. I am done with trying to run my life my way. Here I am, God. When you get to that point in your life and you totally surrender and the Spirit comes in, it changes everything. It's almost like you've taken, you've taken the earmuffs off. You can actually hear. It's like all of a sudden you have this sense of fulfillment, a sense of purpose, a sense of being. I have never ever in my life felt so totally alive when I have totally surrendered. Because I knew what the purpose of my life was. And I felt fulfilled. And then after a little bit of time, I let the fears and the doubts and the distractions creep in. And bam, I'm back to where I am. Hearing the voice of God, but muted. Not always obeying. Sometimes obeying. Hopefully most of the time obeying. But not always because I've allowed the other stuff to creep in. Am I the only one? No. But Paul, we see Paul... Getting to that point where he's actually really, really listening. Where he's really totally surrendered. And I've seen no greater example of this in, in Scripture than in Acts 20, 22. He says here, and now compelled, notice the wording, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen. Not knowing what will happen. I'm going. I am compelled by the Spirit to go. But I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going to happen. And you've got to understand his history. He was, Paul, when he was being called Saul, he was the great persecutor of the church, right? In Jerusalem. 
and the surrounding area. He's going out. And then he was converted on the road to Damascus. And everything changed. Everything changed. And now his own people, the Jews, are after him. We see him. We've read chasing him from city to city, trying to stop him, trying to disrupt him, beating, stonings, etc., trying to kill him. If you look in Acts 9, in Acts 9, when he was in Damascus, they had to, to secretly lower him out through the wall because they were trying to kill him. He goes to Jerusalem and there's a plot to kill him. Right? Now he's been back before to Jerusalem talking with the elders, but you never, when we read about those points, he's pretty quiet. He's pretty quiet. He goes there, he meets with them for a while, they send him back out again. But now he's going back He's going back at a time period where Jews from everywhere are pouring into the city. And he's saying, you know what? I am compelled by the Spirit to go. But I don't know what's going to happen. I am unsure what's going to happen. I could be walking into the lion's den. I could be signing my own death warrant. My God. But this is a man who is completely surrendered to what God is going to do. As spirit-led believers, we will seldom be told what to expect when we obey. God doesn't say, obey me, and this is what's going to happen. Here, you obey me, and I'm going to show you exactly this is all going to work. This is my plan. Do you want to go or not? That's not obedience. God says, I want you to go. And I'm not going to tell you what's behind the door. I'm not going to tell you the future. Will you trust me enough to go? We have some friends that we knew back in Ivory Coast that during the height of when ISIS was in Iraq and, and doing all this kind of stuff, we got a prayer letter from them that said, we're going to Iraq. I'm like, what? That's nuts. What are you guys going to you do? Know, people are fleeing. People are running from ISIS. They're getting out of Iraq. And you say that God is leading you to go to Iraq. It sounded crazy. But that's what they did because they were being spirit-led. And you know what? God has used them in Iraq as missionaries. God has used them greatly there during this time. And He's kept them safe. But they didn't know. They didn't know. They just know that God was, the Spirit was leading them to go. They didn't know the result. If you are truly spirit-led, God may lead you to do something that sounds really, really crazy. He might say, I want you to change your major. Well, my parents sent me to college to go. This was the major. And he may say, I want you to change your major. He may say, I want you to go and I want you to make friends with the school bully. I want you to sit down at his lunch table. Will you be spirit led? God may say, I want you to quit this job that you've got. And I want you to take a job that pays less money. Will you be spirit led? You see, God may ask you to do something crazy that your human understanding says, that's nuts. Guess what? God's smarter than humans. God sees the bigger picture. God has a purpose and a plan for your life and mine. Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to obey without knowing the results? The thing is, spirit-led believers 
Spirit-led believers are sometimes compelled to risk danger and hardship. They are sometimes compelled to risk danger and hardship. We've talked before about the great German theologian and pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a man who in the 1930s was on the rise. He was very influential. His writings were kind of becoming very influential. But in the late 1930s, guess who else was rising up? Adolf Hitler, the Nazi party. Okay, and these two are coming into conflict here. And Bonhoeffer, in 1937, he wrote a very interesting book called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, he talks about the fact that there is no such thing as cheap grace. There is no such thing as cheap grace. We have been given grace, but it's not. It didn't come cheaply. And if you're really to be Christ's disciple, that means that you may have to put your life on the line. You may have to risk it all to follow Him wherever He's leading. Well, that's great to say. But are you willing to do it? In about, I think it was 1938, I think it was 1939, he was given the opportunity to go to America. He went. And a lot of Germans were going about that time too. And a lot of them were staying. They weren't going back because they saw the handwriting on the wall. They saw the Nazi party rising. They understood that safety reason, stay out. And, and Bonhoeffer is already a hot potato. But when he got there, he realized that, that was not where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be back with his people. He was supposed to, no matter the risk, no matter the danger, that God was compelling him to go back. And so he went back. He went back to Germany. And sure enough, through the next few years, things got a little bit hot. He got involved in basically opposition to Hitler. And he and a lot of his circle around him are thrown into prison. And eventually he's executed. Right before they, the Allies liberate the camp where he's at. waste? Not really. Because the cost of discipleship, that book, suddenly became very real. His life of being willing to not be satisfied with cheap grace became an inspiration to others. We have seen through history now that and let me lead, let me read to you some of the the things that they're saying that were inspired by his life. He exerted great influence and inspiration with Christians across broad denominations and ideologies, such as Martin Luther King Jr. was inspired by Bonhoeffer's life and what he was doing, the civil rights movements in the United States, the anti-communist democratic movement in Eastern Europe during the Cold War the anti-apartheid movements in South Africa. All of these movements are drawing inspiration from Bonhoeffer's struggle. In fact, even the United Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church declared that Bonhoeffer was their first official martyr since the Reformation, that they recognized him as an official martyr, Christian martyr dying for the cause. He was the only one, in fact, there's only two since that had since 2017, post-Reformation, that the United Methodist Church has recognized Bonhoeffer as the first. Of saying how important his sacrifice was. Paul knew as well that he was in serious danger. He knew that going back could result in his death. Acts 20-23. He says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. He says, I, I'm being compelled by the Spirit to go. I don't know what I'm going to face. I only know that in every city 
The Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. We're going to read further as we, as we go on in Acts. We're going to see that people are going to come up to him and say, we've been warned by this week, you shouldn't do this. And he's still going. He's still going. The Holy Spirit is saying, this is going to happen. I'm going to tell you, be right up front with you. But Paul's not stopping because of that. Because he's compelled to go by the Spirit. You say, wait a minute, why, why, if he'd been told by God to respect this, why would he go? He could be killed. Because there's a difference. There's a difference between what we would call absolute obedience and absolute choice. Absolute obedience is where you have no choice. You, you go, you obey, however someone is leading you or whatever. You're basically like a robot. You're like a slave. Absolute choice means you look at the situation, you go, I want to do this, I don't want to do this, I'm basing it on my own thing. This decision's up to you. Spirit-led Christianity is like a mesh between the two. It's not being a robot or a slave, but it's not pure choice. What it is, is surrender to God's choice. Surrender to Him and saying, I am choosing to let you be in control. I am choosing, Lord, to let you guide me no matter what. I'm not some robot. I still have free will. But I am choosing to let you be in complete control. Are you willing to do that? It's scary. I kid you not. It's scary. Are you willing? Are you brave enough to step out on faith and say, God, I'm willing to let you do with me whatever you want. I'm willing to let you be in charge. I mean, we may have said that. We may have said that before. Yes, I'm, I'm you know, and you may have the head knowledge. But is it true in your heart as well? Are you willing to totally surrender? To let God be God? To let Him call the shots? Paul doesn't know what to expect other than what he's been told. He could be killed. But you know what? He is so in tune with the Holy Spirit that he probably would have gone anyway. Even if God had said, you know what, you're going to go here, and in addition to the prison and hardships, you're going to be martyred. You're going to die here. I firmly believe that Paul probably still would have gone because he is so in touch with the Spirit. Do you remember Christ? Christ's obedience to the cross? Christ in the Garden of, the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He doesn't, he doesn't want to face this. He doesn't want to die on the cross. He's praying, he's saying, Father, if it's possible, if it's possible, may this cup pass away from me. I'm sure that Paul, we're not told, but I'm sure that Paul might have thought, wow, am I really supposed to go? Am I really going to have this possibly happen to me? But just like Christ, Christ said, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And Christ went willingly to the cross. He obeyed his Father willingly to die. We may, we, you and I may never be called to make that kind of sacrifice. But drawing close to God, if you are, if you are willing to take that step, Drawing close to God in that level, totally surrendering, means you're open to it. You're open to it if that is what it takes to fulfill God's will. You're open to making the ultimate sacrifice if that is what God requires. And you say, how is this possible? Life is important. It is. But our lives, the value of our lives, in comparison to our eternal destiny, This life is a vapor. It's over like that. 
but eternity is forever. And if God calls you to make the ultimate sacrifice, would you? Like I said, likely it's not going to happen to you. Christians, lots of millions of Christians throughout history have never had to make that sacrifice. But many can. Is your faith strong enough that you would be willing to do that? Are you strong enough in your Christian life to be able to say, God, I completely surrender. If you want me to go there, if you want me to die, I'm willing. Paul got this. Paul understood this. And as a spirit-led believer, he was compelled to finish the race and complete the task. He was compelled to finish the race and complete the task. You know, talking to this group, a lot of students in this group, right? A lot of both students in, in the younger grades and students in college. School's tough. Sometimes, you know, you, it's tough just to finish high school. You've got your parents behind you going, you will finish high school, you will. But it's still hard, right? You finish high school, and then you go to college. And boy, college can be tough. The dropout rate in college is pretty high. A lot of people start, not all of them finish. And then if you go for your master's, wow, that's even tougher, right? Working for your master's is tough work. But it's nothing compared to the PhD. The PhD is brutal. The PhD is really, really tough. It is estimated that approximately 50% of the people who actually start the program never finish. And there's lots of reasons. A lot of them is they, they just don't think it through. They don't realize how hard it's going to be. They don't realize that they're going to have to write like they've never written before. They don't realize that the PhD program is demanding in so many different ways. They never complete the task. And they get distracted. You know, life is distracting. It will keep us from goals. It will keep us from fulfilling what we want to do. But Paul is focused. Look at Acts 20, 24. He says, with all of this, I'm unsure what's going to happen. I've been told dangers and hardships are coming. However, I consider my life, this earthly life, worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. This was his life. This was his goal. This was everything, his entire purpose. This is what God had called him to. And nothing short of death was going to stop him. He was going to finish the race. He was going to complete the task. Because that was where the Spirit was leading. He kept his eyes firmly fixed on the goal, no matter what the personal cost. How focused are we? How focused are you in following Christ? How important is Jesus in your life? Say, well, I come to church on Sunday. Okay. That's good. Is that it? Or does Jesus make a difference in your life on a daily basis? As you do your job, as you do your studies, as you interact with your family and friends, is Jesus foremost? Are you being led by the Spirit? Or are you just coasting through life? Because we can do that. We're really good at it. That's not what we're called to do. That's not who we're called to be. 
We are called to be spirit-led Christians. We are called to total surrender. We are called to be 100% God's. And I won't kid you, living in God, living for God in today's world can be tough. It's easy to coast. But that does us no good in terms So are we living the Spirit-led life? The ultimate question for us today. Are we living the Spirit-led life? And I can't answer that for you. You need to spend time with God. You need to be searching your heart and you need to ask God, Lord, am I listening to you? Am I obeying you? Am I willing to go into dangerous situations? Am I willing to do whatever it takes? Am I willing to do something crazy? If that's what you ask me to do. And if you can't answer that, yes. You're just not living the way you should. And I'm not living the way I should. If we can't say yes to it. If we cannot say, God, I give you complete control. Because I guarantee you, when you do, you will be fulfilled. You will be fully alive and not be the walking zombies that basically we are. Do you have the courage to do that? Let's pray. Father God, you've called us to so much more than what we are, than what we experience. You've called us to a life of purpose, a plan, a destiny. Lord. You have so much more in this life for us than we currently experience. Help us to have the courage to step out. Help us to have the willingness, Lord, to, to tune in to the Spirit, to hear your voice to obey. Help us to be willing to totally surrender our will to yours. To abandon ourselves to the, the Holy Spirit. And take that leap of faith. Father, help us to be truly who you call us to be. And I pray for anybody who's listening today, Lord, to have the courage I pray that you would spark that in our hearts. To truly be willing to surrender. Christ. Amen.